is Deborah KMB, and I am a member of the so Super Club. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, my name is Deborah KMB, and I am a member of the Scottish Socialist Party in Edinburgh. And this evening, I'm supposed to chair this meeting about Mohammed Ali. Um, I think some of us um, certainly recently we've seen we have seen TV is passing, and I've learned a lot about the man. Even though at the time he came into the Congo, I was just born that year, so I didn't know much about him. Um, this evening we have this opportunity for Jonathan, as you know, all Jonathan, you know him better than me. <laughs> He's going to talk to us about his life. Before we start, I want to share this um, quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. He says once, nothing in, e in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and consciousness stupidity. If every day we put ourselves to learn about others and things that happen around the world, it makes us a better person. And the stupidity that we see around us, just in a minute, in a second, we realize how bad it is and how dangerous it is in our society. So, Jonathan, this is your time. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, can people hear me without the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay, well, I'm um, not going to talk too much, uh, but I want to probably just start by uh, mapping out a few uh, framework um, issues. Um, I'm going to talk obviously about Muhammad Ali, obviously about his uh, sporting achievements, about his uh, political influences, about his uh, impact uh, on uh, both the sporting world and on, um, uh, and on the society around him. <coughs> but I want to, given what's going on, try and extrapolate uh, from that some wider, um, some wider contextual um, issues that um, I think are useful, are useful to discuss. Um, he's one of these people, uh, very much like Nelson Mandela, who, when he dies, um, there's a whole range of people who hated him uh, when he was alive, but very much like him uh, when, when he's dead. And that often is the mark of uh, uh, people who are uh, willing to rebel, people who are revolutionary in their outlook, and people who challenge the, um, the status quo. Uh, interestingly enough, Donald Trump is one of these people um, who praised uh, Muhammad Ali, said there will never be uh, one like him uh, again. Uh, of course, uh, he's uh, famously a uh, Muslim, and uh, would he uh, be banned from living in the United States is a, an open question if uh, Donald Trump uh, became the president. Um, and just on that, I will end uh, towards, well, towards the end, um, touch on where we are now with uh, civil rights, uh, and I will focus those comments on America uh, in particular. So, Muhammad Ali, of course, when you think about great people uh, who excelled in their area uh, of expertise, you often wonder how they got there, how it uh, all happened. And with Muhammad Ali, he was born in uh, Kentucky in uh, 1942. He was born at, the, at a real uh, moment where you know, he knew exactly what it meant to be oppressed, he knew exactly what it meant uh, to be um, abused racially and so on and so forth. This is of course a time uh, which just comes before the onset of the mass uh, civil rights uh, movement. And, um, Tariq, uh, and uh, Muhammad, Tariq Ali, Muhammad Ali, uh, I do mention him later, Muhammad Ali um, uh, first actually got involved in uh, thinking about how he might uh, become a boxer when his bike got stolen. It was a sort of curious place to feel that his bike got stolen and he um, wanted to run after the individual who stole the bike and he encountered a police officer who then became his trainer who said, well, if you're going to uh, challenge someone, then you better learn uh, how to fight. And that's actually how he started to, to get involved in the whole, in the whole, um, in the whole business of, of boxing, training and that sort of thing. Of course, his name at the time, Cassius Clay. Um, and I'll talk about why and how he changed his name uh, later on. But, you know, he was someone who lived through absolutely momentous times, as we are living right now. Um, but he lives in a time, and he grows up in a time, and becomes famous and well known for boxing, uh, in a time where you have a whole social, political uh, upheaval, revolution going on in the United States. There's a very famous um, interview um, carried out 
uh, by William Buckley, who many of you will know, he was of course um, someone who was a sort of standard bearer for social conservatism and for the right wing um, in American society. He looked upon what was happening during the 1960s with a great deal of horror. He didn't want to see liberation when it came to LGBT rights, he didn't want to see the equalisation when it came to, uh, to race or when it came to income and all these types of all these types of things. He was very much uh, someone of the 1940s and 1950s. And um, one of his famous sort of jousts that he has is with uh, Gore Vidal. And some of you may have um, already seen this, but this debate between him and Vidal really came to sort of crystallise the issues of the day. And there was a real, uh, there was a real almost bad tempered, very bad tempered argument raging throughout American society about the direction which it would take. And so William Buckley does an interview with, um, with Muhammad Ali, and it's one of the most fascinating uh, bits of television that you could watch. I mean, I would urge you to, to have a look at it. It's all online. Um, it's interesting because what happens in the interview um, is that William Buckley says, why do you call the white man a devil? And uh, this is the point where Muhammad Ali is uh, being politicised and so on. And he gives this response when he talks about slavery, he talks about the, the oppression of the present day, he talks about the way in which black people have been treated uh, by uh, white establishment uh, in America. And it's interesting that William Buckley actually then admits after the interview that he was quite right in a sense. He couldn't come back. Uh, I mean, remember this is when we went to lecture of the day, William Buckley. He couldn't come back to this boxer born in Kentucky, you know, he couldn't come back to the argument that really what we were seeing in America was this mass sort of oppression going on, but at the same time connected with it, a rebellion against it which expresses itself in a myriad of ways throughout the 1960s. I will talk about uh, his sporting achievements now before I talk about some of his other uh, interactions with the 1960s in particular. The, um, the Vietnam War. I mean, if you look at his achievements, you look at the impact that he's made in this particular sport, you have to say that very, very uh, unique, uh, just the impact that he makes. Um, he is the greatest boxer that's ever lived. That's fairly undisputed. But the way in which he grows as a boxer is the thing that's fascinating because it's almost as if as he grows as a boxer, he's also growing as a political commentator, as an activist, as someone who wants to make an impact in the world more, more generally. Um, and he won, of course, the uh, Olympic uh, medal uh, for boxing, in which he was, he was lauded as a, a great American uh, sports person. But then political events began to take over. Uh, the Vietnam War, which he refuses uh, to fight in. And of course, there's the famous quote which he says about the um, about the, the Vietnam War, um, which I will read because I think it's powerful and I think it speaks to the time uh, and also speaks to the present day. And he says, "My conscience won't let me go shoot my brother or some darker people or some poor, hungry people in the mud for big, powerful America and shoot them for war. They never called me nigger. They never lynched me." They didn't put no dogs on me. They didn't rob me of my nationality, rape or kill my mother and father. How can I shoot these poor people just take me to jail? And of course he was convicted. And at this point he's not allowed to box anymore. And what I'm trying to do here is to show that it's impossible, in a sense, to dislocate his sporting life, his sporting success, with his political uh, convictions. And I think often there is an attempt to de-link these issues in liberal sections of the media and in right-wing sections of the media. They're very happy that he's a good boxer. Uh, they're very happy that he excels in his um, sport. They're not so happy that he leads this charge against the Vietnam War, that he doesn't sign up, that he doesn't want to fight. And they're even less happy for his reasons. See, it wasn't just because he makes this turn to Islam uh, and renames himself um, it renames himself Muhammad Ali. Uh, by the way, I should say that the, the purpose of renaming yourself is that you don't have a name associated with 
um, a previous slave owner. Um, and it was a rebirth that he took uh, under uh, when, when he makes his turn to Islam, the nation of Islam. But it wasn't even that they could accept, well, okay, he has some religious conviction. You look at the quote I've just read out, it cuts into the very heart of imperialism, of racism, of the racist history of the United States, but it also quite clearly in my narrative cuts into uh, the question of class. Because what he's essentially saying is, I have far more in common, much, much more in common, with the Vietnamese who are being bombed than I do with the American establishment. And actually that sense of class solidarity is something that came to, um, that came to speak for the movement as a whole, the anti-Vietnam uh, uh, anti War movement. There was a real sense among soldiers as well, the United States um, GIs, that they had far more in common with those they were fighting against than they did with those who were given the orders to fight in the first place. He was stripped of his passport, um, he was fined £10,000, uh, $10, sorry, a lot of money at the time, stripped of his, uh, stripped of his rights, uh, denied a boxing licence on every single state. I mean, this is history which is often forgotten when you read about the, you know, the life and times of Muhammad Ali, but stripped of his uh, stripped of his passport. He was prevented from fighting between March 1967 and October 1970. About these years though, for this athlete, for this uh, supreme talent, is that these were the years in which he would have been at his absolute best. And there's an irony in that, I think, that as he makes this statement of opposition to what the United States is doing, then it seems that they take away from him the thing which he's best at, the thing that he's most popular for. Remember that he was widely seen in American society as a real hero for winning the Olympic medal for boxing. And in a sense, it's no surprise that the NSA were tapping his phone in the years after this, the National Security Agency. And there was a real sense, I think, in which Powerful figures, popular figures who were rebelling against the establishment on a whole number of levels, uh, they needed to silence them. Again, I think we can look today and see, I mean, we might, if I dare, draw the comparison to someone even like Jeremy Corbyn. They can't accept discourse taking its place in the mainstream of political discussion if it doesn't fit into the parameters agreed by the establishment. And that's something I think that runs with Muhammad Ali throughout, throughout this thing. I do want to just mention here, just quickly, about the 1960s. I mentioned Tariq Ali um, earlier on, in part because I wanted to just bring in some reflections about everything else that was going on at the time, while he's uh, being stripped of these rights and so on. And uh, of course 1968, a year in which we see obviously the great rebellions in France, uh, taken by students and others. Um, but the 1960s, when you think about it, really is a decade in which things change. Um, you think about the uh, popularity of the Beatles. Now, that might sound slightly out of place in a uh, speech like this, but actually it reflected a, a huge shift going on uh, in culture. Martin Luther King gave his most famous speech, the I Have a Dream uh, speech, in front of a million, a million people. We had the Stonewall Riots. The first time in human history that there were real big protests and resistance over the question of LGBT rights, of course we landed uh, on the moon. Uh, this is a decade I think is important because it seems to me that something happens, and I'm slightly going off on a tangent here, but something happens throughout that decade which I think it precipitates a fork in the road for left-wing and right-wing uh, values going forward in the 70s, 80s, and where we are now. And it seems to me that what happened was that the left essentially won most of the arguments when it came to social uh, arrangements. When it came to the question of race, when it came to the question of gay rights, uh, when it came to the question of this sense of there being a social equality, then I think the left and the progressive movements of the time shaped the decades to come. 
David Cameron, if you look at it, and if you look at you know, John Major, even, even if you look in some instances um, before that uh, at the right wing um, in uh, both British and American uh, societies, then there's a kind of acceptance that on these issues we're going to get around because there's been such an upsurge from below that it couldn't be resisted. But on the economic issues, then they were to, then they were to take their own ideology forward and entrench it in neoliberalism, deregulation, privatisation, and so on and so forth. And in a sense, I think what we're seeing today is that there's a, a new context, there's a new battle of ideas that's taking place. Because what's happening now is more and more people are beginning to question the economy. There's a real sense in which people understand that it doesn't work for everyone, that it leads inextricably to a growing gap between the wealthy uh, in society and the poorest uh, in society. And at the same time, we are seeing a battle rage over the social questions that we face as a society. So if you look at America just now, you have this whole sense in which there's a new civil rights movement, but isn't it depressing that there must be another new civil rights movement in America? Um, Black Lives Matter, of course, um, protesting against the likes of Donald Trump, Donald Trump representing this kind of new brand of social conservatism. We might draw some comparisons with the recent vote that we've had over the question of the European Union. Um, Peter Hitchens, uh, not someone who would often quote, but I think he's interesting, and I think he's an interesting observer of what happens uh, in the world, and what happens in particular in Britain, and um, says that this is a sort of rebellion of social conservatism that we see take place. I'm not sure about that, but more about that later. But I'm just sort of pointing out here that his life takes place in this context, and so does his death. And the death of Muhammad Ali, the way people orientate it, uh, orientate on it, tells you quite a lot uh, about their politics. But, uh, Muhammad Ali also devoted a lot of time towards as well as politics, uh, philanthropy. Uh, he was someone who uh, began to express, particularly to black youth, the possibility of building life, of building dignity, and of building respect. He talked about um, his. Uh, he talked about people giving him awards and so on and so forth. And he said that he didn't want a museum built in his name just full of all his memorabilia, just full of all his, his medals and so on and so forth. He wanted something to be built that suggested or implored other black people in the direction of winning. Now, in his case, he was talking about boxing, but he wasn't just talking about boxing, he was talking about winning respect, about winning arguments, about being dignified, about not letting people put you down. That, I think, is what typifies Muhammad Ali, even if you go right back to where we started, where he gets his bike <coughs> stolen and he wants to challenge the person that steals his bike. Um, Donald Trump, I have mentioned, and I did say that I would come back to him, um, and Muhammad Ali I did have some, some words for, for Donald Trump um, in reaction to um, his comments about banning Muslims uh, into the United States. He says, this is important, he says, we as Muslims have to stand up to those who use Islam to advance their own personal agenda. They have alienated many from learning about Islam. True Muslims know or should know that it goes against our religion to try and force Islam on anyone. If you dissect that, there are some really important insights. And uh, bear in mind, he's saying this at a time where his health is really deteriorating, of course. Um, he suffers from Alzheimer's um, and, and towards uh, the last uh, couple of, uh, last uh, section of his life. Um, but if you dissect what he says, essentially that he, he's drawing what is, what may seem obvious, but which I think is fairly profound, is this sense that actually Islam, the demonization of Islam, what's the point, is being used to the benefit of objectives sought by sections of the ruling class. And of course he's talking here about Trump and he says about people benefiting personally, but quite easily could be talking about the Bush administration 
and the Blair administration, who both, in tandem with, I would argue, a weaponized media campaign, demonized large sections of the Muslim population in order to justify uh, a war against terror. It's quite depressing in a way, and I'm not going to end on the depressing, no, but it is quite depressing in a way that he has this life, that he achieves so much, and this, I think, gets to the essence of what it means to be oppressed. What it means to be oppressed is regardless of what you achieve, regardless of how you achieve it, the, the skill, the ability, the victories that you have, there's always something that's going and running in parallel with that. And that's that you're constantly undermined in some way or other by an establishment who can't accept, who really can't accept that there's the possibility of genuine equality. Let's talk about Obama. I'm just coming to some concluding points. Because the title is about the struggle for justice today as well. Now, Obama, when you think about it, also represents this kind of contradiction. It also represents what it means to live in a society in which oppression is a real and living thing. You have a black president, but at the same time as having a black president, you also have a major spike in racist incidents, in police brutality, in police killings. You also have, at the same time as a black president, this new civil rights movement arise, the need for it, again, which I mentioned earlier. This to me says that liberal, liberal anti-racism or liberal approaches to oppression in general don't work. Because the liberal will say, well, we have equality now. We have a black president. It shows that in America you can do anything. Okay, we've had this whole history of slavery and so on and so forth, but at the end of the day, if you're black, you become a president. Of this, uh, of this nation. Um, of course, the reality on the ground is completely different. I might add that you can see the exact same when it comes to women's rights and to feminism. It makes no difference if you're properly opposed to, uh, to oppression, in my opinion, that you have some level of representations at the highest levels of the system. Hillary Clinton might become the president of the United States, but we all know that how that would advance women's rights. Uh, you get the point. So we need to bring at this point another, of course, famous figure um, and who met um, Hamid Ali on several occasions, which is Malcolm X. Um, and Malcolm X, of course, says, amongst a whole number of other things, that really it's impossible, if you really get down to it, it's impossible to be both an anti-racist and a capitalist. And what he's saying is that given the system, is intertwined inextricably with oppression, given the system that relies on the accumulation of profit and therefore the division of workers. Given those things, you can't actually be in favour of both capitalism and of racial equality. And that, I think, sets people apart when it comes to the movement that we are seeing today. And here I'll, here I'll end. In 1996, Muhammad Ali actually lit the Olympic cauldron uh, in the Summer Olympic Games in Atlanta. And um, you go back to what happened to him after, he, after he's given this sort of national adulation for winning the Olympic medal, but then, but then put in jail. Uh, and it seems, in my view, to reflect a sense of hope. Because I think that's what we do have to end this talk on. Because why do we see all of, the, all of the terrible things that we see today? The division, the racism, the war, the economic inequality, the poverty, all of these things. Muhammad Ali, repre Muhammad Ali represents something which I think never disappears throughout all of those trials. And that is, in essence, his determination against the odds, his willingness to put himself into positions of pain often, his willingness to make sacrifices, but also his determination that all along the way no one's going to be better than him. Not in the boxing ring and not intellectually, not versus William Buckley or anyone else. And it's that sense of determination that I think gives us hope 
and gives us reason to celebrate his life. Thank you very much.